Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight um, on polymer fibrosis, understanding the basics by Dr. Lawrence Homick. Uh, Dr. Homick is a community-based respirologist, intensively based in Winnipeg Clinic, Con Concordia, and the Grace Hospitals. He is regularly involved in medical education for family physicians and fellowship programs, candidates in intense care and respirology. He has extensive experience in clinical research trials involving asthma, COPD, and pulmonary fibrosis with published papers in asthma and uh, hypotherm hypoxemia. Dr. Homick is the co-chair of the multidisciplinary discussion group for the interstitial lung disease, participant in interstitial lung disease advisory boards, and past president of the Manitoba Thoracic Society. He received his medical training and fellowship in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Dr. Homick. Hi, all. Thank you, Sharon, uh, for that uh, nice introduction, and I thank the CPFF for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, tonight, we're going to review some of the basic fundamentals of pulmonary fibrosis. And I just have a few objectives here. We're going to understand, we're trying to discuss and so everyone can understand the nature of pulmonary fibrosis as an interstitial lung disease and what that means, <clears throat> how pulmonary fibrosis changes lung function, and how this change in lung function then results in the development of symptoms that are the hallmarks of pulmonary fibrosis. Then what, ca what ca might cause pulmonary fibrosis. And um, uh, we'll also compare and contrast idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis to other progressive fibrotic interstitial lung diseases and how they're different, how they might be similar. We'll have a brief discussion of diagnosis and therapy, but I'm not gonna go um, in detail in those respects because they've been covered in other lectures in this series. So, we have the broad scope here, the, the large circle of all lung diseases. And pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung diseases are a small group in that broad category. You, you're aware of diseases such as COPD and asthma. These are, these are airways diseases. The, the, the problem is, is within the airways. With any, that, those diseases result in obstruction of, of air going in and out of the lungs. The interstitial lung diseases are a different group of diseases. They affect a different part of the lung. They affect the spaces between the tiny air sacs of the lung and the blood vessels. Pulmonary fibrosis develops when the, those interstitial spaces become permanently scarred. And idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is even a smaller circle within the family of pulmonary fibrosis lung diseases. So you can draw even a smaller circle inside that inner circle of the blue. So what is pulmonary fibrosis? Well, I have a few diagrams to try and um, help uh, depict the interstitial space for your understanding. The first diagram provides a blow-up view at microscopic levels where the tiniest of airways terminate and the little air sacs begin. And I think I have, um, can I do a pointer here or not? I don't think my pointer were, oh, there it is. So you can see the air sacs here delivering air down to the, this is the very end of the, of the, of the airway. And then all, of, and then you have the little air sacs here that are the very end of the lung where the air ends. And these little air sacs are called, also known as alveoli. The alveoli are coated. Um, hang on, I'll go to the next slide. So the alveoli are constantly supplied with fresh oxygen by your breathing, and they are surrounded by blood vessels or coated with blood vessels. You can see this blood vessel here coming down the airway and it's surrounding the air sacs. Okay. These are known as capillaries. The capillaries bring, you notice it's blue, this side the capillaries bring oxygen or bring blood from the body that's been depleted of oxygen. And as it crosses past the alveoli, it starts picking up oxygen and it delivers fully oxygenated blood back to the body through the other blood vessels. 
That's the, the purpose. That's what's called gas exchange. Picks up oxygen, delivers carbon dioxide. These are the alveoli. We call these the alveoli, these little air sacs, and these little blood vessels are called the capillaries. The gap between the alveoli and the capillary, which is a very tiny little gap, you can hardly see it here. I can see if I can get my pointer going in there. That little tiny gap in there, which is hardly perceptible, is, is the interstitial space. And these diseases are interstitial lung diseases. This is where the action occurs in interstitial lung disease. So to remain efficient at this exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, the gap has got to remain extremely thin. And here we have a depiction of what happens when scar tissue or fibrosis forms around the outer edge between the, 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 the alveolus and the capillary. And this is known as pulmonary fibrosis. If it's permanent scarring, it's fibrosis. If it's inflammation, it could be other interstitial lung diseases. You're gonna have a kind of an artist depiction, a little more detail, um, kind of a nice diagram to look at. It's a cross section of the normal looking alveolus which is, now if I get my little pointer going again, where is it? Come on, pointer, there you are. This is the air sac of the alveolus and cross section. And these are the little cells lining the alveolus. And this is the thin edge of the alveolus here. And here we have the capillary cut and cross section running past the alveolus. And here we have the thin wall of the capillary. These thin walls allow the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide fully in the time it takes for the blood to, to transit. If you can imagine the blood's flowing through here, so as it transits this, this little area, as the blood ends, it starts from here, and let's say it runs across to here, that's all, that's all the time you've got to do all this exchange. So there's a time element here. This next diagram shows what happens when you lay down fi fi uh, scar tissue or develop pulmonary fibrosis. It fills the space between, or it thickens the space and fills it between the small capillary and the alveolus. It also can damage the wall of, of both the, I get my little thing here. It damages the wall of the alveolus and it can also damage the wall of the capillary. When this fills the lung in a substantial way, the lung stiffens. We get an idea of how stiff the lungs become by looking at this normal chest x this sorry, these chest x-rays. On the right hand side, we have a normal chest x-ray. On the left hand side, we have a chest x-ray of someone afflicted with pulmonary fibrosis. And just kind of look in general at the size of the lungs in these two pictures. You can see what happens when the lung stiffens, the lungs shrink in size because they're quite stiff. There are other features on a plain chest x-ray that might show fibrosis. But, but these are fairly nonspecific. And in general, the plain chest x-ray is not that helpful in determining if there is or isn't fibrosis. In fact, early in fibrosis, the x-ray can be normal. Oops, let me go back. The HRCT, that is the high resolution CT scan of the thorax. This is the, hang on one second. The HRCT of the thorax gives us a better idea. It's, it's needed to actually show the details and the pattern of fibrosis. On the left-hand side, you can see the normal lung. And the normal lung, just kind of uh, note the edge, outer edge of the lung here. The outer edge of the lung is almost completely dark. The lung meets the chest wall. There's, um, there's nothing going on there. You can't see anything hardly on both sides, the outer edge of the lung on both sides. In the lung affected by pulmonary fibrosis, you can see changes. You see fine white lines all around the edges. These are 
called reticular line, reticular opacities. And also you see the other characteristic finding called honeycombing, which is the scar tissue forming in the lung. It tends to form at the edges of the lung, particularly in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Another depiction of the same thing. Okay, back to our, di our diagram. The fibrosis also affects gas exchange. It impairs gas exchange. And if you can just imagine for the, ga the gas is trying to cross, here I'll get my pointer going again. The gas is trying to cross this thickened, scarred up um, space now. It's more difficult. We call this a diffusion impairment, a diffusion block. When you're resting, the diffusion block is not as big a, as a big a factor, but with exercise, you can imagine when you start exercising and the blood starts flowing quickly, this diffusion block becomes very important and can lead to oxygen depletion in the blood, also known as hypoxemia. And in fact, in pulmonary fibrosis, we often uh, have people with pulmonary fibrosis whose oxygen levels are completely normal when they're sitting quietly with exertion. One of the characteristic features of of um, pulmonary fibrosis is the oxygen levels start to drop with exertion. And this is because of this diffusion block that occurs as the blood flow starts picking up pace and moving across the capillary, through the capillary and across the alveolus more quickly and not enough time to make the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now the other feature, uh, uh, the other reason why gas exchange is impaired is because this, uh, to, to be efficient at, at oxygenating the blood, the, there has to be precise matching of where the blood goes and where the oxygen goes. So they meet, meet each other in a balanced way. And if you damage blood vessels, you know, damage the alveoli, then this matching of where the flow goes and where the air goes becomes disrupted and inefficient. And that also contributes to hypoxemia. So why do we get out of breath then? Well, there's several reasons why we get out of breath based on the physiology we just covered. First of all, the work of breathing is tremendously increased because the lungs have become stiff. So work of breathing increases. We feel that. We feel breathless. The second thing is hypoxemia may occur, low oxygen. And this occurs because of the two things we discussed, the diffusion block, particularly important when you start to exert yourself, and also the mismatch of blood to air flow causing hypoxemia. The low oxygen level stimulates centers in the brain that make you feel breathless. The body doesn't like being low in oxygen. Now, when you become breathless because of the first two factors, you often become less active. And over time, <clears throat> your body becomes uh, deconditioned. And when you're deconditioned, your muscles are become very inefficient. And for a given level of muscle activity, the lungs have to work harder because the lungs are less efficient. They produce more carbon dioxide. The lung, the, the, Lungs got to get rid of that carbon dioxide, they're working harder. So how do we combat shortness of breath in pulmonary fibrosis? How do we take that, you know, to improve that sensation? Well, we've got a few things we can do. We can attack all of these features. First of all, deconditioning, we can exercise and we can recondition the muscles, make them more efficient so that the lung works less hard at any given level of activity. It doesn't really change lung function, but the lungs, but when the muscles are more efficient, the lungs do not need to work as hard for a given amount of activity. That reduces your sense of shortness of breath. Secondly, if a person with pulmonary fibrosis is developing low oxygen levels or hypoxemia, we can, we can supplement with oxygen. At first, supplemental oxygen might only be needed with exertion. But as the disease progresses, it, might not, it may be needed continuously at rest and with exertion. Sometimes we increase the oxygen level to higher levels with exertion <clears throat> because of the tendency to develop that diffusion block when you're active. Now, there's not much we can do about this increased work of breathing in the stiff lungs because the fibrosis is, the, is there and it's permanent. But what we can do is we can alter your sense of this work of breathing. We use medications that work centrally in the brain like opiates and they, they kind of blunt that, that feeling of, of uh, breathlessness because of this work of breathing. 
and they can they can tremendously reduce that sense of shortness of breath and actually allow you to do more and be more active even though this that this work of breathing has been increased so those are three general ways we combat this back to our our little, our little drawing here another result of fibrosis is that when you've got the scarring through the lungs and the interstitium there are cough receptors that are in this in this region because when uh, the lung normally when when something irritates the lung something's been inhaled the receptor goes off you cough you ex you expel whatever is irritating you if whether it's infection or whether it's something you've inhaled that's an important fact feature of the lung the problem with fibrosis is it stimulates these receptors when there's really there's no need to stimulate these receptors there's nothing you need to cough out it just creates a cough for no good reason and this cough uh, although it doesn't serve any purpose it it, is, it can be a major problem in some patients and some person people who have pulmonary fibrosis it can be difficult to manage also and it can be very debilitating in some people um, so this is one of our one of the the, the key areas where, where we try and deal with to make people have a better quality of life is to improve the cough now when you're tackling cough in pulmonary fibrosis um, you don't want to forget about the common everyday causes of cough because they exist in all kinds of people you know whether you've got fibrosis or you don't things like gastroesophageal reflux disease and post nasal drip those are common conditions and so they can exist in people with fibrosis and you have to make sure you don't miss those simple things that are easily treatable when the cough is is not caused by those factors and it's because it's caused just because of the fibrosis then we're kind of stuck it's difficult to deal with but we can use medications like opiates morphine hydromorphone or codeine to suppress the cough reduce the cough reflex centrally gabapentin can also be used as a central inhibition of the cough reflex that can be helpful in some people with persistent coughing so what causes pulmonary fibrosis well we suspect what we suspect it is that there are an repeated little micro injuries to the lining of the lung whether this is something from, that you inhale or something from within the body in, in immune diseases that damages the lung or something other external like radiation for example it, it's, <clears throat> it's something there are micro injuries to the lung and if your lung heals normally then there's no fibrosis it goes to you know after an infection the lungs heal, you have a normal healing response, there's no fibrosis. When you have repeated micro injuries, and for some reason the body has an abnormal healing response, then you can develop either inflammation or you can develop scarring and fibrosis. Now there's both genetic and environmental factors that are important leading to this injury and abnormal healing process. We think the environmental factors probably lead to the injury and it's in your genetic predisposition to how you react to that injury may be what leads to the, the the abnormal healing process can lead to fibrosis now it's we don't fully understand why you know a lot of people will be exposed to the same environmental factor and not everybody gets fibrosis so we don't understand why some do and some don't get fibrosis although they are working out uh, they have been shown they have found some genetic changes in some patients that make fibrosis occur to a greater degree or be more likely to occur so sometimes we can identify the cause of the pulmonary fibrosis and um, you know your doctor might when he interviews you might be asking you when he's suspicious of fibrosis he will ask you these kind of questions you'll want to know what kind of medications you're taking because there are some medications for example amiodarone which is used to control the rhythm of the heart or Nitrofurantoin, also known as macrobid, which is often used to control to treat bladder infections, or certain types of chemotherapy. All of those kind of medications can, in some people, lead to pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease. Radiation to the chest, in the, uh, ever, if you've ever had that in the past, can lead to fibrosis. And here's an example of an environmental stimulus that can be. I mean, if you have enough radiation. You know everyone will get fibrosis if you give given, given enough radiation so you don't have to have an abnormal healing response when your environmental stimulus is strong enough like radiation for example 
Um, exposures, inhalational exposures are very important and you'll be asked all sorts of these questions. They can be in the workplace. The classical example of workplace inhalation exposures are asbestos, where you develop asbestosis, which is a form of pulmonary fibrosis. Or if you work in hard rock mines or with sandblast and you inhale silica dust and silica dust exposure can also in some people lead to pulmonary fibrosis. Um, other inhal inhalations, which may occur in the workplace or even in the home, can be things like mold or from bird dust, for example. And mold, you might find mold when you've had, if you've had water damage in your basement or in the, in the round windows. Um, might also occur uh, on moldy hay that's used for feeding uh, cattle. And this is known as, with that exposure, if that causes a reaction in the lung, it could, it's known as. Uh, farmer's lung. The, the dander from birds. Oh, uh, one other si time we, you might find mold is in humidifiers that where they're not being cleaned out often. The stagnant water in humidifiers can get moldy. You get, it's called humidifier lung. Bird dust from their, the, the dust between the feathers can cause a similar uh, immune reaction in the lung leading to fibrosis, known as bird fancier's lung. Those, these are examples of what we call hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Sometimes when it's early, that just leads to inflammation, but when it's chronic, it can lead to fibrosis, permanent changes. Um, you've probably listened to some of the lectures discussing the autoimmune diseases that can lead to fibrosis, like rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma, and others like Sjogren's syndrome. These are diseases that can lead to fibrosis and inflammation in the lung as well. Now, in many cases, we can't identify the specific cause of fibrosis. And we come up with this term idiopathic, which means unknown. Which, and un, you know, so if it's idiopathic fibrosis, it's un, the cause is unknown of that fibrosis. Now, as it turns out, when we say idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we, we're actually uh, referring to a very specific type of fibrosis of unknown cause. It has a very specific pattern. And we go through the typical investigations and we don't find any causes. And if, it ha if you can't find a cause and it has a very specific pattern of fibrosis, we term this um, idiopathic point fibrosis. This pattern can be seen on a CT scan and sometimes on a biopsy. There are other types of fibrosis for which the cause is unknown, but these are less, less common. Even when we know the cause and someone has fibrosis, as I said earlier, we still don't always understand why someone gets the disease of fibrosis and others don't. Now, although in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, um, we don't know the cause, there are potential risk factors that seem associated with idiopathic fibrosis with things we see more common in, the, in people with fibrosis, in idiopathic fibrosis than you might, than you would see in the general population. And those would be things like a long history of cigarette smoking, um, maybe acid reflux disease, which could lead to injury of the lung, environmental factors, like if you work in an occupation where you're inhaling a lot of uh, dust, whether it be uh, wood dust, metallic dust, or vegetable dust, all of these dusts that you inhale, there is an, a bit of an, so a higher chance of getting fibrosis. And of course, there are genetic factors that play a role. We think these environmental factors then give you the little micro injuries and that, and that your genetic predisposition, how you respond to these in injuries might be what leads to the fibrosis. So, um, you can see uh, th these are two studies of uh, registry studies <clears throat> looking at all the different causes of fibrosis in the registry. And you can see that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a portion of, it's a good portion of that pie, 20 to 25 percent, depending on which studies you look at. But there are other conditions that lead to fibrosis of the lung. And the, the ones that are, we see commonly are things like chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis or this is CTILD, that, that means connective tissue diseases or autoimmune diseases. They're quite important. And then there are some that are unclassifiable. We don't know what they're, what they're caused by. And others are like the in inhalational diseases and sarcoidosis might also contribute 
I don't want to get too far into these other diagnoses right now, just to realize there are other causes of fibrosis. So of these patients with interstitial lung disease, we have, and who develop, let's say, fibrosis, I want to show you one more concept here, the concept of progressing fibrosing interstitial lung disease. So these are diseases that tend to, where the fibrosis, once it's there, it just keeps going, it just tends to progress and progress and progress. And idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is in this group, and in fact, it's always in this group. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis uh, always leads to progression, progressive fibrosis. We call it the progressive fibrosis phenotype. Phenotype is just how the, the behavior, the outward behavior of the, of the process. But other diseases can behave sometimes similarly. There are other diseases that, who, that lead to fibrosis, such as um, hyper, HP, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is like farmer's lung or bird fancier's lung. Um, autoimmune diseases like from rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid lung and scleroderma lung and other inhalational diseases, exposure inhalational diseases. About, they est we estimate about 30% of these conditions that lead to, that other diseases that lead to fibrosis can develop this progressive fibrosing phenotype where they behave much like idiopathic plant fibrosis. Many of those cases, you know, seem to be to develop some stability in their condition and may respond to some specific therapy, but but about 30% of them in these other conditions behave much like idiopathic fibrosis and develop progression. So this leads to this concept of splitting and lumping. Um, early in the course <clears throat> of interstitial lung disease, we think it's very important to try and make a specific diagnosis. And, uh, and the reason we do is we'd like to know, you know, because th there are different treatments for the different diseases. You know, whether you have uh, idiopathic fibrosis, well, you know, this is gonna take you on the pathway of getting antifibrotic medications in initially. If you've got chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, man, we're gonna try and have, uh, do every effort to try and find out what's causing it and getting it out of your environment so you don't, so that, that stimulus has gone away. Sometimes we use anti-inflammatory therapy in chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis as well, immune modulatory therapy. That type of therapy is a big, is a mainstay of treatment of autoimmune diseases. So drugs like prednisone or mycophenolate or azathioprine are often used to treat interstitial lung disease associated with autoimmune diseases. So why would we ever want to lump them together? Well, what happens is if these diseases like chronic, HP, chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis or autoimmune diseases or other connected to other fibrotic lung diseases, if they don't respond well to their initial therapies, and they develop this progressive fibrosis phenotype, which they can, they tend to behave a lot like idiopathic fibrosis, and we tend to lump them together as the progressive fibrosing diseases because they have the same prognosis and they respond to the same therapies. And so we start lumping them together. So early on, we like to split, make precise diagnoses for precise therapy. If, if um, and IPF uh, will have its own therapy, but we, but these other, but IPF-like treatments start to become important in these other diseases when they fail their specific therapy and they tend to show progression in the fibrosis despite treatment. The approved therapies, of course, for IPF are esbriot or profenadone and OFEV or nintenidib. Um, these are not curative therapies. They don't reverse fibrosis or stop it completely, but they sure slow the progression by about 50%. And we hope that the hope is that over time, there'll be pre preservation of quality of life and perhaps longevity. OFEV has more evidence for the other, uh, both drugs work well in idiopathic plant fibrosis. There's more evidence for OFEV showing the benefit for those other progressive fibrotic lung diseases. 
So how do we diagnose IPF? Well, um, it's polyfibrosis identified by the CAT scan uh, or it, sometimes with lung biopsy, mostly by CAT scans though. We usually first suspect fibrosis when someone, uh, when a person comes to the, to the doctor and is complaining of being short of breath with exertion, maybe a bothersome persistent dry cough, low energy. And at the same time, when on the examination, you can hear these very characteristic crackly sounds in the lung. Usually it's at the very, very bottom at the back of the lungs in the very bottom, you hear these fine crackles, they call Velcro crackles, uh, when someone takes a deep breath. So that combination of those Velcro crackles at the bottom of the lung and those kind of symptoms really starts to push us in the direction of thinking about pulmonary fibrosis. Um, sometimes there's, there are CAT scans done for other reasons. I mean, we do so many CAT scans now, CT scans for other reasons, and they catch, you know, let's say you're doing a CAT scan of the stomach or the belly, uh, the abdomen, you, you'll catch the bottom of the lungs. And so you happen to catch the fact that there's some fibrosis uh, occurring. And so that can lead to a diagnosis. And that can lead to an early diagnosis if the person isn't, very, isn't having a lot of symptoms yet. Unfortunately, about 50% of the people with fibrosis are diagnosed only two or more years after their symptoms begin. I think that's changing now with more awareness, but this is, Traditionally, that's been the case. So how do we diagnose IPF? Well, it depends a lot on the, on the history and physical. It's very important. Um, you, want to, you want to try and identify the known causes first as you want. You want to split them up. You want to find the cause if we can find the cause because it leads to specific therapy. So there's a history and physical, and we talked about all the questions your doctor's going to ask you about different exposures and medications and diseases you may have. And, um, and then there's a set of blood tests. And the, the blood tests can, uh, are, are, are performed based, you know, to look for signs of autoimmune diseases that also can lead to a specific diagnosis. And then um, when we suspect pulmonary fibrosis, we get a, a CT scan of the lungs. Now, a regular CT scan can show fibrosis, but you really need a high resolution CT scan of the thorax to help diagnose a type of pulmonary fibrosis. It gives you much greater detail, gives you a bit more information about the exact pattern of the fibrosis. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip that. So um, the diagnosis can be difficult. It's not always straightforward. It's not a simple diagnosis in many cases. And that's why most centers in Canada have developed this concept of the multidisciplinary discussion group or collaboration. And uh, so we get together as, as uh, pulmonologists or lung specialists, we get together with the, the specialized thoracic radiologists who have the most experience reading thoracic CT scans, high resolution CT scans. We get together with the pathologist in the same room and sometimes the rheumatologist. So we all get together basically in the same room, although now we were on Zoom together, but we used to get together in the same room and we, and we review these cases individually try and come up with a specific diagnosis. And we find when we do this, we, we are more accurate with our diagnosis. And we come up with better, better plans. <clears throat> so what happens after diagnosis? Well, um, this is sort of a plot of, the, of uh, polyfibrosis, the natural history of idiopathic polyfibrosis. And I think you could use the same diagram for those progressive, those other fibrotic diseases that show progression despite treatment. They, they kind of start behaving just like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and we treat them similarly. And you can see um, somewhere, this little dot, or this little green spot over here is where, is where the um, symptoms begin. And we think somewhere before that are where the lung micro injuries occur over time and the abnormal healing response occurs and after a period of time when enough fibrosis develops you develop symptoms now in past years you know you'd had symptoms for a couple of years before you make a diagnosis and you know this led to sort of discussion about what the prognosis is and fibrosis being uh, i don't you know a, sh a shorter period of time and i think most experts today 
feel that patients are living longer with pulmonary fibrosis for a couple of reasons. For one reason, we're starting to pick up disease much earlier, sometimes even before the symptoms have developed, if there's been a CAT scan performed for other reasons, and also closer to the onset of symptoms because there's more awareness. That's one reason why we think people are living longer. The second reason is because now the treatments we have, the antifibrotic therapies we have, we think are, by slowing the disease process by 50%, is resulting in a slower decline in, lung, in, in, in the dysfunction of the lung. Now this decline is still unpredictable in any individual. It can be faster, it can be quite slow, it can take steps down, it can have flare-ups. But um, in general, we think we are slowing the, the process with the, our treatments and our earlier diagnosis is helping. Um, although I'm not going to go into details of, of each therapy, I just want to show you that, that treatment of IPF to improve quality of life in, in people who suffer from this, this process is a multifaceted approach. There are many aspects to treatment. You know, we, we, we um, want to firstly encourage regular exercise and perhaps engage in a pulmonary rehabilitation course. It's very important. Flu vaccine, vaccination, pneumonia vaccination to prevent, to prevent uh, viral infections that might flare up or, or worsen the, the scarring in the lung. Treatment of esophageal reflux if it's present, so they reduce the, the injury to the lung that might occur. Um, controlling symptoms like shortness of breath and coughing to improve quality of life, maintaining adequate nutrition. And then we have the antifibrotic medications, which we think slow the process down. We also think psych psychosocial support is important, whether this is from family or friends. Sorry family or friends or even a structured support group. Support group meetings are very, very helpful. And also the, the pulmonary fibrosis rehab programs can be very helpful because you get, you, get, you get a lot of education, you, get, you feel more empowered. And finally, if, if, it's, if it's indicated, transplant of the lung might be, a, might be an option for some people who have pulmonary fibrosis. And as I said, I don't want to go into more detail because these, all of these aspects are covered in other lectures in the series. And I encourage you to, to, to check out those lectures. And if you haven't, if you've missed them, that's okay because it's going to be on the uh, website, on the, PF, on the CPFF website, I believe in October. They'll all be available for review. So after diagnosis, you will have a team of professionals that can help you out. You'll have your your primary care physician, your family doctor, you'll have your pulmonologist, um, your lung specialist to help you. They're in, the back, in the background, you'll have radiologists and pathologists and rheumatologists giving advice. And if you attend a, pul a pulmonary fibrosis rehab clinic, you, you might see a nutritionist, a dietitian, respiratory therapist, physical therapist helping you get reconditioned. <clears throat> There's lots of help uh, from, from a lot of professionals. Uh, to make this process, um, to improve this, this process of this disease and keep quality of life as, for, uh, as good as possible for as long as possible. And I think I want to end on that and uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Holmick. Uh, and now I would ask the audience if they have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Holmick. Uh, Dr. Homick, our first question is, you know, why does it usually take so long for someone to be diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, well, uh, the, the reason is, is that the symptoms are a little bit nonspecific. It, it happens a little bit on the, the, the patient's side, a little bit on the doctor's side. You know, it happens, this disease happens, especially idiopathic fibrosis, <clears throat> tends to happen in older individuals. So as we get older, when we're in our 60s and 70s, you know, we become a little less active and we maybe gain a little bit of weight. And so when you start to get a bit of, a bit of shortness of breath, you kind of say, oh yeah, you know, I'm out of shape. I'm, I'm, I should do some more exercise and you don't. And, you, and, you, um, and so you allow sometimes these symptoms to develop before complaining enough and, and also on the other end, the physician <clears throat> also sees people often who complain of shortness of breath 
who are getting older and getting who are out of shape and gaining weight. And so and that's such a common thing that that you miss you get missed in the in the noise of all these of, of all those uh, complaints from other routine things that, that show up in the doctor's office. And this can lead, you know, if you if if you miss those, you know, if you miss those crackles and like you're listening to those crackles, that's a really that is early. You, you pick that up early in the disease. And so and you listen to the bottom of the lungs, hear those crackles, and you have those kind of complaints that should really twig you to think. But, it, but it's, it's all this noise of, of people who, as they're getting older, getting out of breath, that are from totally, you know, sort of benign conditions and, you know, deconditioning and weight. Uh, it, it leads to some neglect of those symptoms, and, and it reduces the, the um, it, you know, reduces the sensitivity of the phys physician sometimes to respond quickly. Okay. Um Dr. Holmick, someone wanted to know, you know, um, you talked about the cough, which a lot of people with PF or IPF have. Um, first part is, are there any natural remedies that people can do other than those uh, medications that you had listed? And the, the part two of that question is, why is it um, they don't cough when they're eating when they're, you know, doing other stuff, they're coughing continuously. Yeah, eating and sleeping sometimes, there's no coughing. You wonder why is that? Yeah. Well, the, the act of swallowing actually is inhibitory uh, to the cough reflex. And so it, it's a transient inhibition of the cough reflex. And so it will actually reduce coughing by that mechanism. And when you're sleeping, you're breathing more shallowly, you're not stretching the lungs as much. And so this lack of stretch of the lungs, uh, the, the, those receptors, you know, because of that stiff lung and the fibrosis, any little extra stretching of that, you know, when you're talking or moving or exercising, that, that, ex that increased movement of the lung and the stretch of the lung, just those receptors start firing off. So when you're sleeping and you're breathing very shallow, you're not, you're not stimulating the receptors very much and you may not cough. And when you swallow, you would, it's an inhibitory reflex. And I think that's, that might explain why. Now, as far as natural remedies, I'm not aware of anything that might work. Um, I'm not aware, but like there's nothing that's been studied, you know, scientifically. But um, um, you know, some people will just will take things like even you know cough candies and things like that can sometimes be helpful. And now, and some and or, or chewing gum can be helpful. And sometimes it's because when chewing gum, you're swallowing all the time, swallowing all the secretions and and that can be helpful. But um, yeah, I'm not aware of, of any specific natural remedies that have been looked at specifically to see if they're, they, they work or not. Okay, um, another question. And somebody said that they've been diagnosed 10 years ago with IPF and they have a really bad cough uh, for the LAGS, L-A-S-G-G. L-A-S-G-G. Yeah. What is that? I don't know. I'll ask the person if they could maybe clarify that. Um, okay, we'll just move to the next question. Next question is, what is the difference between a respirologist and a, uh, palm a pulmonologist? It depends where you live. <laughs> we're called pulmonologists in some places and respirologists in other areas. I think we're called respirologists in Canada and I think pulmonologists in the United States. I don't know, something like that. Oh, okay. Thank we're you. The, we're the same thing. Okay. Okay. So the person came back. They said that they've been diagnosed 10 years ago with IPF and have a bad cough for the last one and a half years. Right. Also, the crackle noise in their chest has disappeared along with the cough in the last month and a half. Any ideas why it has tapered off? Huh. Oh, that's such a hard thing to say on an individual because there's so many things that might be contributing to the cough. Usually um, the cough, by fib if it's caused by pulmonary fibrosis, it's a little unusual to kind of disappear unless you've done, unless you've had some treatment of the, you know, of the cough, like with opiates or, or, or gabapentin or something like that. Now, other things that cause cough can come and go. If you've got reflux disease, if you've got postnatal drip, that can always come and go and you have cough and then and cough goes away. Or if you, or if you have a viral infection and you get a post-viral cough that can last sometimes for six months and then it goes away, that can be another cause of a cough that will go away. Um, 
sometimes with fibrosis, you can get times where you, your disease might flare a little bit and it gets a little bit more acute and you might cough more then. And when that process settles down, it, it, the cough might settle. But those are, the, those, those are the only explanations I can come up with so far. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know a dry versus productive cough, difference in treatment and causes. Yeah, so uh, the cough in polyfibrosis is typically a dry cough. Uh, sometimes you have little bits of mucus, because whenever you're coughing, sometimes you stimulate mucus glands that are, you know, to, to make a little bit of mucus. If you have a highly productive cough, then you always want to be looking for other causes of the cough other than the fibrosis. You know, is this a, a, a postnatal drip? Is this a problem with rhinosinusitis and drainage on the back of your throat? Um, that might, you know, and, and, or an infected, infected sinuses. If the mucus coming up is yellow or green, uh, the sinus is infected, um, causing that. Or if the cough, you know, suddenly becomes productive, uh, with a bit of a fever and, and, and with a head cold, you know, is, is this an infectious cough that has complicated the fibrosis and now developed uh, increasing um, phlegm production and discoloration of the phlegm. Um, those, are the, uh, those are the kind of things I think about when I, when I think of it, when this productive cough. I'm always looking to see if there's a cause of that that might be treatable um, the dry cough might still be something treatable. I mean, you can still have a dry cough from a, a postnatal drip if, if you don't expectorate the phlegm. And you can still have a dry cough from reflux, esophagitis, and you can have a dry cough from leftover from a virus. And so the dry cough isn't always just the fibrosis, but, it, it, it's, it, but that's more typical of the fibrotic cough as the drier cough. Uh, Dr. Holmick, someone wanted to know um, if they have uh, scleroderma, um, but they've never had a problem with their lungs. Is this something that they should like ask the rheumatologist to say, should they get a checkup on their lungs? Yeah, well, you know, if they're, if, if they're pretty, if they're relatively physically active and they're not coughing and they're not short of breath, that's probably good evidence that their lungs are reasonably good, normal. But yeah, they, they should, they should see their, when they see the rheumatologist, they should ask the rheumatologist if there's any evidence of fibrosis, you know, they should ask the rheumatologist, listen to them, you know, listen to the bottom of their lungs. Are there, are there any crackles there? If there are any crackles, they may want to get, uh, uh, or, if, or if there's any symptoms, they might want to get a high resolution CT scan of the chest, look for fibrosis, and maybe get some lung function tests done to see if there's any characteristic abnormality on the lung function test that might suggest fibrosis of the lung. Okay. Uh, someone else wanted to know, uh, with COVID-19 um, virus going around, um, if you're a survivor, does this mean you're going to end up with pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, no. But uh, I'll say that, yes, you, you can have, you know, I, I mean, any, um, with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, sorry, with COVID-19, uh, when you get really sick and it, and it floods the lungs with inflammation and inflammation tissue, uh, that's known. That's known as a cytokine storm. It's it's this. It, you know, it's not necessarily that the virus is going crazy in your lungs. It's 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 the virus has set off. It's made all your immune cells just pump out way too much of these cytokines that create inflammation. In small amounts, these these cytokines that create inflammation are important to fight off the 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 the, the, the infection. But when you make way too much, you overdo the response. All of, a, all of a sudden, these cytokines start hurting your own body, and they start hurting the lungs, and the lungs get damaged, and they fill with fluid, and they can hurt the kidneys, and they can hurt blood vessels and, and, and alike. And when you get that cytokine storm, and you end up in hospital, and you end up uh, you know, needing oxygen because you've had a lot of inflammation in your lungs, whenever that happens, then uh, as, as you heal, you might heal completely from that and be perfectly fine, or you might heal with some leftover scarring and fibrosis that's when you might have a leftover of the of the scarring when you've had that tremendous inflammation in the lungs now, and the same thing can happen even if you've had influenza if you because influenza sends people a small a much much smaller portion of people get really 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 sick from influenza than covid but they do but you'll see the same thing just as sick just as much the cytokine storm the in the, in, in the hospital in the intensive care unit on the ventilator Tremendous inflammation, and again, there's they when they if they if they get better, 
Some of them get better completely, and a, and a portion of them, however, might be left with some lung dysfunction. Same with COVID-19, same with other diseases that do that same thing. Okay. Um, the, the last question for you is someone from a, a patient group. They said that in their patient group, um, some people have said that they've had this disease for 10 years and they seem relatively no progression. And yet others who've been diagnosed a year or two have um, progressed further along in the disease. Is this due to genetics? Is it due to good fortune? Yeah, it's probably a mix of those things. It's, it's, pro it's probably not just luck. It's probably a, a, a manifestation of what the injuries were at the beginning and how your genetic response to those injuries and how, uh, and, and how um, it's a combination of that, I think, that, that governs how, you're, how you progress over time. And some people progress quickly and some people progress very slowly. Sometimes the people who progress very slowly, however, can all, all of a sudden have a flare up and they go right downhill uh, sharply for a while before they settle out again, if they settle out. And so uh, and about 10% of people can have a so-called exacerbation of idiopathic plant fibrosis in a given year. And that can suddenly change, even in someone who's been stable for quite some time. So it's very unpredictable. And, it's, and I, I don't have a good explanation you know, to say why some people go very slow and others go quickly. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to ask the audience one more time if there's any other questions uh, for Dr. Homick before we um, close the session. It doesn't look like we have any more. Dr. Homick, I want to thank you very much for your wonderful presentation tonight. Um, it was uh, very fascinating. I learned more from you than from the other ones as you went and explained it on a very basic level. So thank you very much. And I want to thank Bowringer Ingelheim Canada and Roche Canada for their support uh, in giving CPFF this opportunity to have this platform to allow our audience to be able to hear from wonderful presenters like yourself. So thank you very much, Dr. Holmick. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.